for the balance sheets. And really only in the last, only really in the last five years are Indonesian corporations ready to do business? Or is the Indonesian government ready to move forward? Um, so we have our own challenges, and now we're a democracy. Uh, the U.S. is a democracy, but oftentimes when uh, there are disputes in Indonesia, uh, the U.S. expects the Indonesian democracy to function like a Chinese government system where everything just works top down. <laughs> but democracies are democracies. Uh, Washington, D.C. this week has its IRS scandal. We have our own. Um, that's, what, that's how democracies are. And um, that in Indonesia, we're proud to be one as well. <laughs> At the same time, uh, we should also remember that um, <laughs> and, and, and I say this uh, with, with all humbleness, uh, but I think if the U.S. Uh, would like to see Indonesia as a partner, uh, it needs to be more consistent in acting in that way. Uh, oftentimes, uh, and I'm, I'm just a bystander most times, uh, when I see uh, how our governments interact with each other, not to say that our government is, is perfect, uh, but there are a lot of ways in which I think the U.S. government should also uh, treat uh, Indonesians as a partner. Uh, and you know, this, is a, not a, this is not a unique case. Oftentimes, uh, when you have countries or individuals or corporations that amass large amounts of wealth or power in a short period of time, there is a rebalancing of power, and there is a power struggle. Uh, and as Indonesia, you know, today we are different from how we were 10 years ago, uh, and the U.S. must recognize that. Uh, and we want to be treated as equals. Um, again, we're not perfect, uh, but I think uh, the recognition needs to go both ways, uh, that I think for our relationship to fulfill its expectations, to fulfill its uh, possibilities, uh, work, uh, there, need, there is uh, work that needs to be done on both sides uh, of, of, of the game. Thank you. Pat, um, you know, it's been, I think, about three years now, or maybe four, sorry, if I don't remember exactly, since Exum signed, it, uh, signed a new agreement to start working, uh, start loaning again th to Indonesian projects. In, in the, since that uh, agreement, how, how is Indonesia, how is Exum's lending to Indonesia going? Or how, how quickly are your projects expanding? Well, actually, you know, we've been, uh, we've been open in, uh, in Indonesia for some time. Uh, we did sign as part of the uh, Trade and Investment Framework Agreement with ASEAN uh, an agreement uh, on, on some of the economic outreach issues. And I'm happy to report that thanks to the uh, strong efforts of AmCham, and uh, cooperation with Indonesian buyers and, and our ambassador, uh, Ambassador Jalal here, as well as Ambassador Mosh Ciel. Things are going really well. Uh, our portfolio has doubled uh, in the last two years. Uh, we supported 280 million uh, in uh, exports uh, to Indonesia in fiscal year 2010. And this year we've already hit 1.2 billion. Um, the other good news is that our product portfolio is diversifying. We started with Lion Air, one of the biggest orders Boeing has ever placed. Uh, also recently did something with Garuda, also an aircraft. Uh, but just this year, we've also committed to uh, fire trucks for the Jakarta Airport, part of the safety initiative under the ASEAN Open Skies Agreement. Uh, and also, uh, very importantly, uh, local locomotive refurbishment kits to peak T Ka. So we remain uh, bullish. In fact, we were bullish early on Indonesia last year in 2011. Uh, before, the, before the rating uh, agencies, uh, XM actually upgraded uh, the country risk rating uh, for Indonesia. Uh, it will be challenging to maintain where we are. Uh, Indonesia, as we all know, is the fourth largest uh, country. And as of the end of last month, our portfolio uh, with Indonesia ranked number four amongst more than uh, about 150 company, uh, countries uh, globally. So to get this growth, uh, what, what strategies has Exum developed? Well, uh, I, I, I think a lot of the things that have been mentioned here have been integral to, to our strategies, and it's really been a three-point um, effort in cooperation with all of our stakeholders. Uh, one, we targeted. Uh, number two, we looked at earlier intervention in the purchase cycle. And thirdly, which is critically important, is we've tried to take a whole of government Team USA approach. So if I might um, just illustrate that through the, the PTK transaction, because I think that's a really good example 
of the great results we can get to the mutual benefits of international buyers uh, as well as U.S. exporters when we all work together. Um, at the targeting stage, um, XM and US, uh, USTDA, the Trade and Development Agency, uh, both identified commercial opportunities that would flow out of uh, regional policies, in this case, the ASEAN Connectivity Initiative. So at our conference last year, we invited uh, Pak Jonan from PTK to come and speak about the connectivity implementation in the railway systems uh, in Indonesia. And USTDA uh, offered uh, PTK uh, a, a, a grant uh, to assess the feasibility of, of, of their upgrading of their signaling system. Uh, then we move to the, uh, the stage when we really need to qualify and identify the prospect. And the Foreign Commercial Service through Commerce Department and the Embassy team, in, including Ted Osius, who was DCM at the time in Jakarta, did the heavy lifting. They came up with a list for us. I was in Indonesia, and James Lewis, our Asia business manager who's here today, and I met with, um, with PT Ka. And we, uh, we understood what they were looking for. And so we, uh, after our meeting, we got together with our underwriters and said, you know, there's a lot of potential here. So before they even asked, on an unsolicited basis, we offered a, a letter of interest for $100 million. And finally, uh, as the deal, you know, deals take time to, 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 to close, but as the deal stalled a bit, um, Ambassador Mar Scott Marcial himself became the chief advocate to keep it together. And he was you know, going back and forth between PTK and GE, the locomotive uh, uh, contractor, and ourselves to make sure that everything came together and the financing um, was delivered on time. So I think this is a really good example of the cooperation element and collaboration element of our, of our strategy. It, it, it's win-win-win when it's done well. Pak Yos Herman. I know you're pretty new in your job, but from what you understand, um, how, how do you think uh, U.S. investment is going uh, compared to what uh, the levels that it used to invest? Okay, thank you. I think uh, my optimism is uh, based on the data of the investment in U.S. investment in Indonesia, Indonesia last year, because last year U.S. investment is the fourth largest in Indonesia, without 1.2 billion U.S. dollar, but. This first quarter of this year, the investment of U.S. investment in Asia around 0.9. I think it's quite a <coughs> increase between Indonesia and uh, investment of U.S. in Indonesia is getting better. And now, in this position of U.S. investment in Indonesia is the second largest one. I think uh, it's indicate time to time the condition, the Indonesian is the most uh, promising country's destination for U.S. investors to come. It, could you tell us a little bit in, in what areas the U.S. investors are most active? Uh, today, uh, last year, we have uh, more than 90 projects of U.S. investment in, in, in Indonesia. It's very, uh, it's not only for the traditional one like uh, mining. But we have a, like a, a restaurant hotel, also uh, the transportation equipment business, and uh, a pharmacy. I think it's, uh, the range, the, the project is very time to time. I think it's a good indication for Indonesia. That's why uh, we are here, our, uh, my office here, IFC is the representative of uh, our coordinating board of Indonesia to become, not only to promote the investment of Indonesia, try to be, uh, what you call it, uh, clearing house agent mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. So we can get closer to the business in, Europe, uh, in America. Uh, even we have small office in, in center of business in New York. Uh, I think it's a good time for me to be in New York and to be in America, try to learn that's why it's an honor for me to be here in the last, in the last uh, two weeks in America, <laughs> trying to get the atmosphere of business here and what we're going to do. Because we try time to time to uh, change about the investment uh, regulation 
For instance, like today, uh, this year, we tried to revise our negative list. And we hope in the end of this third quarter, we have new negative list of investment. And the idea of uh, the new negative list is not to make more negative, but we, the, the spirit <laughs> is to open the investment from uh, not uh, for uh, all sectors in Indonesia. That's why uh, it's my optimism to be in uh, America, try to get more inward. But today, we have another uh, job, to how to manage our outward. Because today, Indonesia, investment, uh, Indonesian investors already here. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's a different condition. So that's why like, uh, we have Sinarmas here. We recognize that Sinarmas already in America. So the condition is completely different compared to the many years ago. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, it's only one way, in America to Indonesia. But today, we have similar condition. Great. Literally. I think it's good. Great. Thank An you. Anoop, you, you referred to the, um, the middle income trap uh, in, in one of your comments earlier. Do you see Indonesia as potentially um, getting caught in the middle income trap? And, and as part of that, are they spending enough on things like health, education, Labor, skill labor development uh, to, to partially at least uh, be able to avoid the middle income trap? No. Sorry, I was asking no. a new, sorry. Me? No, a new. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I think, uh, as I said, I think at the start, um, we looked at um, countries in other regions, and we've seen that they have been affected by what is now called the middle income trap reach a certain per capita GDP level. And there are a lot of lessons as to how you can avoid it. It helps to have good demographics, which Indonesia will have for many decades to come, and that really helps it. Uh, it has a fairly open economy. It's had an open investment policy for uh, many years. It's growing integration. These are all positive factors. But a central point, as you look at countries that have been able to avoid the middle income trap, including in Asia, Korea, and other countries, you've got to keep up your infrastructure capacity. You've got to keep ahead of the game. You've got to be creative and innovative and technologically move ahead. Economists call this uh, productivity, total factor productivity. The reason I mention this is experience tells us countries that reach this stage, which is called middle income, the likelihood is, from experience, that your productivity is going to fall, which means growth is going to fall. So if a country wants to avoid it, He's got to get his productivity not falling, increasing. And productivity is very difficult to achieve and to increase by focusing on investments and production in natural resources, oil and those industries that are very capital intensive. So it's very, it's very complicated to get your productivity back up and keep it high without spending on research and development, having a financial system that supports creativity and investment in research and development, and essentially it comes down to building up your manufacturing sector. And this is important for Indonesia because Asia is also changing. The demand that Indonesia has benefited from by China's demand for coal and natural resources and fuel, if China changes its growth model and much of Asia changes its trading system, moves more towards a region that is supplying final demand within the region and is not a region that is exporting final products to the United States and Europe, if the whole growth model is going to change in Asia, as it probably will need to, that is a second important reason why 
Indonesia will need to change also the anchors of its own growth. And I think in the end it comes down to how do you do this? And you need to have more investment. It's not just in physical infrastructure. It's as much in educational. Indonesia is ahead of many countries in its educational achievements. It is ahead. But there's more room to go. Because that is important for the creativity that is needed for being ahead of the game in sectors of growth. So I think the good news is it has a lot of advantages. It's got the corporate and economic fundamentals. It's got the demographics. And there is no reason, and I, I remember some years back, the finance minister, who is now becoming the governor of Bank of Indonesia, he told me two years ago, he said the most important objective he has, he told me he's only one objective, to get Indonesia's infrastructure investment up. And he recognized it's not just getting investment up, it also is means implementing what you project. To, if you look at Indonesia's public finances, where they project and plan for higher capital investment, implementation always falls below the targets. And he told me two years ago, this is his number one objective, in, and he was right. And if Indonesia can do this, there's every reason to believe he's got the comparative strengths to avoid the middle income trap, raise its potential growth, and remain a growth leader. Doug, from your perch at the uh, at the uh, at the US Chamber at the AmCham, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges facing U.S. companies? And do you sense, like uh, uh, Pak Yas Harman was saying, that there is an increasing level of investment? Oh, oh, definitely. I mean, there's there's um, uh, a huge amount of excitement uh, it, among uh, U.S. companies in Indonesia. Uh, AmCham represents 250 of the largest American companies in the country. Uh, basically, everyone wants to increase their investment. And so I think this is where the, the disconnect happens. There, there's a strong desire and a belief in Indonesia that investment, uh, there are huge opportunities. Uh, and then companies find it difficult to, to realize those investments. And I think that's where the, the tension starts to come in. Um, and I think we need to figure out, I think companies need to change the way they interact with Indonesia. Frankly, I want to pick up on something John just said. It is absolutely a two-way street. And I think that American companies, it's, I mean, at, in MCHAM, I'll often talk to American companies which will tell me how difficult it is to work in Indonesia and how darn hard it is. And they're big in India and they're big in China. And, and you can't tell me that India is much easier than Indonesia. And so I find this, so I think that we need a step, American companies need a step change in our attitude. We need to engage Indonesia no longer at, breathlessly as this incredible democracy success story. I think we should just accept that as the new normal for Indonesia. In, it's, it's the new normal Indonesia is a democratic country. Rather, let's engage Indonesia as we engage India and Brazil as a rising economic power. Then we change the way we think about the country. And I think, we, I think so part of it's our own way of approaching the country. And I think we need to acknowledge much more readily uh, the, the laudable aspirations behind Indonesia's policies. Sometimes we may, and friends can disagree, that the policy choices or the regulations might not be the, uh, the right fit from where one sees, sits, but we should appreciate that there, I, I think on this issue of the investment of the uh, middle income trap, Indonesian government officials are obsessed that the country avoid getting stuck in the lower middle income space. I, and I think we, we, but we never acknowledge that. And I think we, the other thing we never talk about from our trade side and our trade of, uh, relationship is poverty. Indonesia is obsessed with reducing poverty. And we never have a discussion on how trade can contribute to Indonesia's goal of reducing poverty. So I think we, we talk past each other somewhat. And so I, if we engage Indonesia more as an emerging uh, economy, as one of the world's uh, great economic growth stories rather than just b continuously, breathlessly repeating the praise for Indonesia as a successful democracy, we might take ourselves in a better, more constructive space. John, you alluded to some of these issues that uh, Doug is referring to also. Uh, how, from your perch at KIKAS, the uh, U.S.-Indonesia Committee in the, in the Indonesian Chamber, 
how does this, how does some of these tensions, these differences look to you and what suggestions do you have for how American companies might function more effectively in Indonesia? I, I share uh, Doug's comments. Uh, I think it's a good way of looking at uh, things, uh, which is uh, the world we live in today is the new normal. Uh, we are now a democracy, we'll continue to be one, and in a democracy, things get messy. Uh, I think many U.S. companies are still doing extremely well in Indonesia anyways. Um, so the question then becomes, uh, it's a risk-return profile for businesses. Uh, it's definitely a high-return market. It's also a high-risk market. Not a, not an, I, don't say, I don't mean political risk as in a political upheaval, but political ris risk in terms of regulatory risk and things like that. And those are things that businesses just have to deal with. Uh, and I think businesses, at the end of the day, have to decide whether they want to be businesses or they want to be NGOs. If you're an NGO, you take regulations and you try to change them. In a business, yeah, you try to change them, but at the end of the day, if it's, if it's A, you take it as A and you live with it. You price it into your model and you, you, you work with it. Uh, and I think U.S. companies are learning to, to do that. And, and, and number two, uh, don't take things personally. All the issues you guys are angry about Indonesian businesses are equally angry about. <laughs> it's the government, you know, what do you expect? Um, so, but you know, we, we can go to sleep at night knowing that at the end of the day, business is good. There's very few markets that we would rather be in than Indonesia, and it's a great place to be. Uh, and lastly, uh, the question of intent. Um, many U.S. companies or uh, government uh, d departments, uh, every time a new regulation comes up or a new development takes place which is negative, uh, you assume the worst. You assume intent on the part of Indonesian businesses. But as Doug said, Indonesians, or the Indonesian government is very concerned about the middle income trap. That's exactly why they want to say they want to move up the value chain, things like that, which therefore leads to policies such as some of the ones in which uh, you know, the export bans and things like that. You may disagree with the regulation, but the intent of which I think is pretty, uh, it's okay. We wanna move up the value chain, we wanna reduce poverty and things like that. Um, unfortunately, sometimes that intent manifests itself in ways that are not so good. Uh, but we're learning. Um, and, and another thing to, 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 to realize is, uh, I've sat in meetings between uh, government, G2G meetings where the U.S. side, you guys have two binders filled, everything indexed, color-coded, everything. The Indonesian side walks in with, like, like this, with the day's itinerary and some scribbles on the, on the margins. <laughs> you don't realize how blessed the U.S. is in terms of the depth of human capital. You have a Ph.D. expert for everything. <laughs> we don't. Our ministry is stretched. You have one guy dealing with trade for Euro, uh, multilateral trade for Europe and Africa and, Indonesia and, and, and the U.S. and the Americas, and we just don't have the capacity. And when people don't have the capacity, they don't feel secure. When people don't feel secure, they just can't open up. Um, so it, sometimes uh, the, you know, what you see at the surface is not intent to sabotage the U.S. It's more out of just pure, innocent, uh, we're doing our best. Uh, but deal with us uh, kind of thing. So uh, if, if our, you know, my advice to U.S. businesses, stick in there. It's a great market. We're doing the same. And number one, realize that it's a new norm. Don't fight it. Accept it. We're not NGOs. We're businessmen. Number two, what was number two, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> number two is number, number three. You know, it's, it's don't assume the worst. Don't assume intent. Uh, we are uh, far from perfect, and it'll take a while for us to get there. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just how things are. Pat, uh, uh, um, uh, last fall, President Obama, in, in at the, when he was in Indonesia at the East Asia Summit, announced the U.S.-Asia-Pacific Comprehensive Partnership for a Sustainable Energy. Uh, and it, uh, he announced also there's going to be a total of about $6 billion in, in financing available from Exum and OPEC. Do you see opportunities for U.S. companies, Indonesian companies, uh, out, of, out of this new initiative? 
Uh, yes, uh, you know, definitely. Um, and I think, in fact, both sides uh, will benefit. And so uh, the, the facility that XM offered is $6 billion, and this is to help promote sustainable energy uh, within the Asia, Asia region, but with special em emphasis on uh, ASEAN. Uh, as you know, Indonesia co-chairs uh, the, the partnership uh, with uh, Brunei. And so uh, when we looked af after President Obama's uh, announcement, uh, we began looking at how we could utilize that facility. It's easy to offer a line. Getting it used is where the real challenge is. Uh, so we took a somewhat different approach from in the past. And uh, in January, uh, I convened a, uh, a meeting with the uh, ASEAN ambassadors to the US, with the US ASEAN Business Council, uh, with the US Chamber of Commerce, and with the whole of government. And our discussion was, we have this line. You know, how do we use it? Because when it's used, that's when the Indonesia and the United States exporters really achieve the mutual benefit. If it's not used, then when next time we meet with Minister Agus, he's going to want to know why, you know, we're not drawing on that line. So uh, we identified, each of the countries identified uh, some of the areas where there's strong potential. Uh, and so I think that what we've come up with now is a list of projects that the ASEAN countries would like to see pursued, and we're also matching those with the interests of the private sector. Um, to do a transaction, we need a buyer and a seller. And I think sometimes in the United States, we've always put the emphasis on the seller, pushing product to the markets. And that's important. We're known for our, aggress our ag aggressive sales efforts, and we do it very well. But the other side of the equation, and there are countries like Japan and Korea that do it better, they are really side by side with the buyer, defining what the buyer wants, helping them to, to, to write the RFP and achieve it. So in the case of Indonesia, uh, some of the areas that have been identified um, include uh, uh, LNG, uh, geothermal, and uh, distributed generation. And we're now working to bring it down to the actual uh, project level. Another thing I think, again, and just to follow on some of John's comments, I think sometimes uh, as Americans, we put all of the emphasis on what people tell us. But in Indonesia, I find we need to study uh, uh, shadow puppetry a little bit. Um, so last couple of years ago, we lost a very, XM did, did, was unable to do a very large deal that we had spent several years in, and it was a local consortium of banks that stepped up. That's fine, because if there's commercial financing, we don't need to be there. Uh, but then we also realized in looking at this that we have a gap. We needed an Indonesian bank to be working with. So in relation to this comprehensive partnership, we have now qualified uh, BNI, uh, as a uh, master, I'm going to get this wrong, um, but it's a master uh, guarantee. We've signed a master guarantee agreement with BNI, which has a large, um, a large energy portfolio. So we hope to have some deeper roots into the local marketplace. You know, before I open up, up to the floor, I'm going to ask one more question. Uh, it's probably on everybody's mind thinking about 2014. There's going to be both uh, uh, parliamentary and presidential elections. So John, um, looking uh, ahead to these, do you guess that the elections will lead to any significant changes in the trade and investment space that companies uh, will face in Indonesia? If our ambassador becomes, decides to run, maybe things might be different. <laughs> 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 Very diplomatic. So what's the real answer? <laughs> Sorry, Dino. <Dino. laughs> the real answer is sitting in front of us. I know, I know. <laughs> it's the real deal. It's the real deal. You know, we have, we have 32 uh, registered parties in Indonesia, 11 of which have been qualified to participate in the elections. Uh, about six of them will uh, pass the 3.5% uh, parliamentary threshold, uh, which will give them representation in the parliament. Um, and three of them uh, will be able to put out a ticket um, f uh, to a, a, a candidate, a slate, uh, a presidential slate. Um, of the three or four parties that will likely be able to do that, uh, most of uh, the parties already have a candidate, uh, whether or not officially announced. Um, so that's the base case. So the base case is status quo. It's either going to be one of the names we've heard and things like that. Now there's a few sort of what ifs. And these are 
pos possible what ifs. And if those what ifs happen, things may change. But for the most part, uh, I think we'll have status quo. Uh, we won't have a huge sort of breakthrough increase. But as Anupa said, a lot of the a lot of the economic achievements we've achieved are not really active sort of because of Indonesia. It's sort of in spite of some of the policies. And therefore, a lot of it, a lot of those are, are structural reasons for why growth has happened. So those structural reasons will continue to be there. Uh, there's no reason to believe why if we have a different president, those structural things will change. In the longer uh, term, uh, those may be issues and concerns. But for now, the next uh, 2014, 2019, uh, I think pretty much uh, status quo. And that's good news and bad news, but for the most, I, I think for the most part, it's actually good news. Thank you. Okay. Doug, you, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I think I, I absolutely agree. I think it, um, we, we have heard, uh, occasionally people have asked in, in, in Washington this week, as well as in Jakarta, you know, will Indonesia become a riskier place depending on who wins the election? So the short answer to the question is um, uh, no. I mean, the Indonesia that you would be comfortable investing in today will be more or less the same Indonesia in January 2015. And there's three reasons why, and then there's two wild cards. The first reason why Indonesia is not going to change is that the electorate is wary of dramatic changes. It's a very pragmatic, thoughtful electorate. Elections are, are generally well run, free and fair. There's a savvy middle class. Um, and as John said uh, so compellingly earlier, uh, democracy is here to stay, and I see very, very little indication that that's going to change. Uh, but it's a conservative electorate, hence the wariness of dramatic change. So don't expect dramatic change one way or the other. The other is that regardless who wins, and who, by the who we mean president here, um, the countervailing and constraining vo forces in Indonesia today are vast, diverse, and powerful. They're geographically dispersed. They're dispersed throughout the community. You've got one of Asia's freest uh, press. You've got one of the largest and most dynamic civil society movements in, in Asia. Any president, any winner has to contend with this same uh, array of forces. Any president, any new president will have a coalition, likely a relatively weak coalition, much like President Yudhoyono has had. So that's going to be, uh, I think, the prevailing uh, uh, set up in Indonesia after the election. And then the two wild cards are uh, the two most exciting uh, potential uh, uh, forces in the race, and that's um, the current governor of Jakarta, Jokowi. You cannot have a discussion on Indonesia today, I'm sorry, Murray, unless you talk about Jokowi, Jokowi Dodo, the governor of Jakarta, because as we all know in Jakarta, every single poll tells us, and this is the most polling research country in Southeast Asia, that if he runs, he's likely to win run away with it. If he doesn't win, run, Prabowo will likely run away with it. So these are the two names you've got to put on the table, and Indonesia will be, there might be some difference in nuance, depending which one of those uh, may win, but otherwise more or less uh, the same investment climate, I think. Anu? Uh, maybe I, I could just add one thing which we should not forget. If you look in the last 10, 15 years, you look at what Indonesia has done in improving its fundamentals, and you look around and see how difficult it is to get that done in other countries around us. If you look at what they've done on the corporate side, the financial side, the fiscal side, and public debt over 15 years, and they've kept it up. To me, that is clear testimony that there has been a substantial political and social consensus to get it done. Mm. And assuming I'm right, it means there is a lot of consensus in the country on taking forward the economic reforms that need to be taken forward. I do think we should keep that in our minds. Okay, uh, it's your turn now. You're, uh, now that the food is settling and you probably need to <laughs> wake up, do some people want to jump up and ask questions, please? In the middle back here. And if you could please introduce yourself, uh, your, your affiliation, and if you ha are addressing your question to somebody in particular, please uh, do that. Thanks. Thank you very much for a very informative panel. My name is Linda Yar. I'm with uh, Partnerships for International Strategies in Asia at George Washington University. And uh, my question to whoever would like to respond is, as one of the countries that is most vulnerable to climate change, how is the, both government and private sector thinking about uh, factoring in both the negative impacts and the positive opportunities for the future? 
Do we have a volunteer? Question. <laughs> 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 Should I say next question? <laughs> uh, anybody have any thoughts? <laughs> Doug? The only, the only thing I'd say is that in the <laughs> um, on the business side, uh, American companies uh, involved in green technology, alternatives and renewables are very high on Indonesia and see it as a, a much more promising investment space uh, than, than some of the other more traditional uh, energy f uh, forms. Um, and I think that the government has put a, a lot more uh, innovativeness and dynamism into thinking about and planning for the incorporation of renewables and alternatives into the country's new national energy strategy that President Yudhoyono announced a year and a half ago. So I think, I think actually I'm, I'm relatively high on the directionality from a, from a business side and from a change in the energy mix in Indonesia side. Anup, did you have a, did, sorry. I was just going to make one comment on the broader issue of environmental change and environmental needs. And as you know, it's a big issue today, uh, and that is of excessive energy consumption and its effects on the environment and the role that is being played across the world from energy subsidies. And Indonesia is a large country. If it's able to take the steps, as with other countries, to reduce this excessive energy consumption and open the door to new investments, green industries, there's a lot of potential and I do believe they know they need to do that. Pat. Yes, and, and uh, you know, just to refer back to one of another CSIS event, uh, last month uh, Ibu Karen from Pertamina uh, was here and, and one of her key points is that they are, uh, Pertamina is, is accelerating uh, development uh, of renewable energy sources. And I think that these kinds of initiatives uh, uh, hopefully helped uh, through the uh, US-Asia Cooperative Energy Partnership will provide not only the technology and the international expertise, but also the funding uh, to do it. Uh, energy security is, is a real issue uh, throughout Asia, and especially with the fastest growing uh, countries. And one other thing I'd like to mention is that, you know, I think that there's a perception that the U.S. is getting to the point that we, you know, we don't want to finance coal. I mean, we understand that coal is very important to the economies of these uh, fast-growing countries, uh, but we need to sometimes look at offsets. And in that regard, uh, there may be a model uh, in, uh, in India where we, uh, we funded a coal plant, but we also got a commitment to, 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 to start and finance the largest solo operation. Uh, in India. So that's a, a balance. Sometimes you can't have it just one way because renewable energy, number one, costs so much more and number two is not as productive as some other sources. But I think trying to find the balance that enables uh, the countries to meet their, their growing needs and at the same time shows responsibility towards the environment uh, is the way to go. Could I, a hand raise? Right, sorry. Can I? Sorry, please. Something? Please. Uh, I think in terms of investment in Indonesia, our new regulation about the tax holiday, one of the excess sectors uh, included in the tax holiday is the green industry. So I think it's a good thing uh, to know that Indonesia is much concerned about this, about in terms of investment. I think that's, that's good. Uh, way in the back there is a hand. Hi there, I am Barbara Berska. I work for one of those companies interested in developing infrastructure in Indonesia. And I'd like to address the elephant in the room, which is the fuel subsidy. And I would like to hear your views on whether Indonesia is likely to roll back the fuel subsidy before the elections or after, and its impact on the investment climate. Because for example, <coughs> S&P recently affirmed its rating of Indonesia, but with negative implications due to the subsidy. And from my perspective, I'm looking to put together a project finance package to finance, say, a power plant and with a multi, potentially decade payoff. So I'd like to better understand the investment climate from that perspective. Thank you. Somebody want to take a, a bet on when the fuel subsidies come off? <laughs> well, let me just make one comment on that. And that is not an issue which is confined to Indonesia. It's an issue across many countries, including in Asia, including in India. It's a situation that in many countries, including Indonesia, uh, countries are spending more 
on subsidies, including energy subsidies, than they are on physical and human infrastructure. And that is a real problem across many countries. So I will not in any way single out Indonesia. Now, in Indonesia, I think there is no doubt that it's an important issue. And my own personal sense, it's a strong commitment of the government to move ahead. And I think over the last year and two, the government has tried to move this forward. It's a broader issue, uh, and because it's, on the one hand, it's energy subsidies, which is well recognized across the world, do not benefit the poor. Now, linked to that is, why can't you do away with these subsidies in these countries and provide a better protection to the vulnerable? And I would say, if we can make progress on that issue, it will help us dealing with energy subsidies. And here I think we need to look across the world, across the regions, because if you look at Latin America, you've seen the success in that region, including Brazil and others, in building up these conditional cash transfers, which have helped from a fiscal point of view and from targeting the poor and helping those who need to be helped. Now, Asia, for some reason, has not done that. What Asia has done is focus more on subsidies, hoping they help the poor, and not focusing on actual government cash transfers, conditional transfers, that will directly help the poor and not take up fiscal resources. It is now happening. Philippines has started to build this quite significantly. Indonesia is also starting to build this. And I think if you look ahead the next five, 10 years, let's not look beyond the next 12 months. I think Asia as a whole, including Indonesia, needs to build up how do you help the poor more directly, because not only is that needed, it will free up incredibly large fiscal resources which can be better used. And I do believe that is what the president of Indonesia is trying to do right now, is to get the parliament to agree on these cash transfers to allow them to shift the focus from subsidies to actual cash transfers. This is a big issue across Asia. John? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent and uh, very uh, accurate uh, economic uh, assessment of uh, fuel subsidies. Uh, if I may add a political angle to that, uh, the question was uh, whether uh, we can expect uh, the fuel subsidies uh, to be rolled back uh, before the 2014 elections. As a political matter, uh, that is extremely challenging. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, in whose interest is it to roll back these subsidies? The current administration, or the rule, ruling coalition, uh, cannot, cut it, cannot roll it back, or they have no political will to roll it back, because if they do, uh, that would be, you know, it can be easily painted as an anti-poor um, move, as much as we know that it really isn't. At the same time, the people who oppose uh, a rolling back of the subsidies will also not allow the current administration to roll back the subsidies, because if they do, and they implement a cash transfer program, then it gets a question of, on the cash transfer card, uh, who's, you know, if, if, if people think it's the current government giving handouts, they're going to do well in the elections. <laughs> so you know, now there's talks about, okay, let's put every political party symbol on that little card. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is, it's, it's in no one's interest. The current administration can't really roll it back because they might get, you know, they're gonna, it's going to be used against them. Uh, but the opposition also don't want it to be rolled back because if they do, and they put in place a cash transfer program, uh, that program may also be seen to be used to buy votes uh, for the election. So it's actually a lot more complicated than, uh, it's, it's a complicated thing. Uh, but I, I, I may, you know, we, we, we should note that the SBY government has twice, I believe, right, cut fuel subsidies. All the previous presidents before SBY would announce it about 
a year or so before the end of the term, and then, and then leave it to their predecessors, their, their successors, to deal with it. SBY cut sub fuel subsidies twice. This is when our ambassador was spokesperson. And so, you know, I think he's, he deserves some, some credit for that. Please. Wayne? Uh, Anup, you mentioned manufacturing as a, a really a priority that Indonesia moves into. At the same time, John, I remember your predecessor at Kikas, after the president was elected, came over with a Kadin white paper and very high on the list of priorities uh, and everyone thought, okay, this is something we're going to be able to do is changing the labor law. Now we've had 10 years of the same labor law in Indonesia, which many companies see as a challenge for manufacturing investment. So where does the labor law stand, stand with Kadin uh, and perhaps AmCham? Uh, is it still on the back burner? Is it up, up front? Is it, going to, is it going to change to meet the, uh, the goal that uh, Anup has mentioned? Well, I won't answer the question what's going to happen to it, but let me just give some context. Again, Indonesia is not alone in this, but Indonesia is among the countries that has probably the largest informal sector. Means people are employed not in the formal sector of the economy, in the informal sector. It's got high youth unemployment. To deal with these, you need to change infrastructure, but also you need to change the labor law. And the need to do this is well known. It's an issue, again, in many countries. It's probably worse in India. But the reality is it needs to happen to get people to work in the formal sector, both from a social and an economic point of view. So you're right in raising the issue as being critical. Uh, Wayne, that's a good question. Uh, the labor law has been um, one of the most contentious issues uh, over the last few years. If you ask me uh, whether it is still on the on the cutting agenda, then of course, uh, you know, as businesses, uh, issues of minimum wage and labor law are always an issue. Uh, but it's also a very complicated issue. Uh, on the one hand, um, the uh, poverty uh, in Indonesia is a serious concern. Uh, you know, the minimum wage prior to the increase in Jakarta was about $180, is that right? $180 a month. You cannot live in Jakarta with $180 a month trying to raise a family, put kids to school, and pay for rent. It's impossible. So that somehow has to increase. At the same time, from the point of view of, of business, it's not, a, it's not a question of increase or decrease. It's a question of productivity. Are they earning? what they're getting. And if they're not earning what they're getting, then no matter what their living situation is, they'll just be out, you know, they'll soon be out of a job. So there's no easy solution. Uh, and it's one that I think, uh, you know, the, the businesses have fought tooth and nail to keep it down. Uh, not Kadin, but primarily Apindo has been more uh, vocal on this issue. Uh, the labor um, uh, unions are much better organized these days. They're much more sophisticated. And they're doing a good job, and you know they're labor, so you you know they need to fight for what they're fighting. Uh, the issue right now, I think, is um, not so much the di the debate uh, between labor and businesses. It's some of the um, it's some of the what you call it, the inefficiencies, the deadlock that has resulted from there. A lot of the uh, the demonstrations, the protests, the sabotage, uh, the sabotaging of properties, things that that's really what what is a problem. And this is where I think our government needs to step in. Our government needs to show leadership. I mean, businesses will fight for business. Labor unions will fight for the, fight for the laborers. But it's a government's role to, 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 to come out with a statement and say, listen, guys, this is how it is, and try to mediate something to happen. Um, so that's, I think, what we're waiting for. Please, sir. Hi, I'm Ted Fishman. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer. Um, this dovetails with some of the other questions. Uh, 
ma if manufacturing is going to be this uh, savior for Indonesia and bring it up, you know, to middle class and above for uh, the poor population, it needs a kind of manufacturing that can do that. Um, I'd like to ask you what kind of manufacturing is appropriate to do that if, if China starts outsourcing cut and sew jobs and light industry jobs in Indonesia, there'll be very low wage jobs. Um, automation is also becoming pretty viable in all kinds of manufacturing that used to be uh, very low wage. And uh, in the United States, higher output is not correlated with higher employment. In fact, it's negative towards employment in manufacturing. Um, Indonesia has a creative industries initiative. You even have a cabinet minister on creative industries to have mass creative industries for the rest of the world to avoid this kind of China trap of uh, low wage production jobs. Um, can it get where it needs to go economically uh, for low income people with a creative industries initiative? And then just related to that, if creative industries are going to be big for Indonesia, uh, what's the prospect for trade in creative industries? Can it assert itself globally with creative industries? And recently there's been some problems with creative industries getting into Indonesia. <laughs> um, maybe you can comment on that. I know that's in your portfolio, John. John? Uh, the issue of manufacturing is, um, is a complicated one. Uh, I share uh, Anoop's uh, comments that if we are to uh, overcome the middle income, income trap, uh, we must build a viable uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are now living in a world with great uh, technological uh, transformations. Uh, when Jeff, Jeff Immelt uh, was in Jakarta a number of months ago, uh, he gave a talk and he says, uh, today, uh, to build one refrigerator, it only takes two hours of labor. Only two hours of labor. And his point, what we, you know, he was trying to illustrate a point that right now, uh, because of technology, uh, labor co matters much less and less. So for him, what drives whether he's in a particular market is the market itself. If I want to be, let's say, in, in market X, because that's a huge market, consumer market for me, it really doesn't quite matter if the cost of labor there is higher. Because it's only two hours. Everything else is technology. And those two hours uh, of man labor, you can move it to someone with cheaper labor, but you'll lose that uh, because of the cost of shipping. Um, so it's unclear. Uh, you know, I don't know uh, what manufacturing sector. Uh, from the point of view of, of Kadin, uh, we're not so concerned about that. Uh, you know, we think businesses will do what businesses do. Uh, so as long as the government creates an environment that facilitates that to happen, including infrastructure and uh, certainty and labor laws and things like that. Businesses will come in. Um, so that's that. Uh, on your, uh, with regard to your question on, on the creative industries, uh, yes, uh, you know, this has been a concern. I'm not an expert in this field, uh, but I, knew, I, I do know that there are uh, serious discussions about taking a number of industries off the negative list. Uh, a number of d digital agencies, you know, WPP amongst others, are you know have been having uh, a lot of discussions with our government as to how they can be allowed to own um, and and be more invested in Indonesia. So I think some of that is changing. Please back here. Rob Colorina, AIC Investments. We have the benefit of manufacturing investment in Indonesia. My question is more on the, the creditor and the class protection side, so maybe uh, Patricia and, and Anoop. Um, you had mentioned some of the restructuring of reforms in banking. Um, are there any significant highlights that go to protecting other creditor classes from secured debt and, and even sort of the unsecured class? That would be helpful to know. And, and also, and John, just as a follow-up, it'd be interesting to hear about uh, equity capital inflows, if there's uh, any material change that you've seen in the last few years, that would be helpful. I think in terms of the uh, Indonesian banking system, I should defer to my, my colleagues from Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, in terms of banking system in Indonesia, uh, we have uh, some restriction, of course, because uh, uh, the 
condition of uh, economy in Indonesia is based on uh, the uh, the uh, medium low uh, economy. I think is we have to uh, what you call it because it's uh, yes. Um, I gotta say something about this because it's too far. Because about the banking system is a little bit more uh, concerned on the and the, uh, our uh, economic uh, coordinator. Yes, is uh, sorry about the, the the banking system. I think it's better to ask me about the, uh, the manufacturing something about that. <laughs> it's a new things for uh, Indonesia to talk because there's a lot of discussion to talk with the uh, Bank of Indonesia, Central Bank of Indonesia to to say something about this. Is there any a ba Indonesian bank today uh, attending this uh, seminar? I think it's good uh, to get the, the, the uh, a perception about this. Mm. I'll, I'll take note for this, I think. No problem. Sorry. Please. Urban Reeves, H2O's Fuel. Like in the United States, the change in labor and industry as a whole is far outstripping the ability of us to educate our young people and our populations to work in a knowledge-based, non-manual environment. The one thing I haven't heard here today is are we doing, are, you know, what's going on educationally? I know in your constitution you have an educational mandate of a certain percentage. It seems to me that's the way to start to address, perhaps not the current generation, but you know, the five-year-olds. So at least there's a floor. You've stopped the bleeding. Uh, same thing we need to do here. So I think that's a global problem. Um, thank you. Um, there's a question. I mean, do somebody, I don't know if we have an educator here. Um, John? I'll take that question, and not so much a question, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think the single biggest uh, factor, long-term factor in economic growth and uh, overcoming the middle-income trap is education. Uh, and the question is, if Indonesia 20 years from now wants to become an innovation economy, uh, whether we are educating students who will or can serve uh, in that sort of an economy, uh, and that's sort of what we see in the U.S. Uh, now we have many companies who say, I can't find the kind of people I want. At the same time, um, unemployment is, is high. Uh, there's a mismatch between what companies are looking for and the available kind of labor. The same is happening in Indonesia. Uh, so if we are to uh, move on to a, a higher value-added economy, uh, we need to make sure that we're educating kids uh, who will be able to uh, provide that function going forward. Uh, I, I wanted a, uh, I think there was a comment about capital inflows from Ross uh, that, I, that I didn't answer. Uh, yes, uh, we've seen a huge increase in, in uh, equity flows coming in to Indonesia. Um, and uh, some of the reasons for that is because our economy is doing so well, but I think a big fact, an, an, a bigger, an even bigger factor is the fact that there's just a lot of liquidity right now in the market, uh, too much liquidity. And I think we, we see that uh, by how uh, bonds are being priced uh, by uh, the performance of uh, capital markets globally. Uh, we're continuing to break sort of record highs. Um, so yes, uh, equities uh, coming in extremely strong. Let me just make uh, one comment on education. Uh, even though Indonesia has many advantages, including its constitutional requirement to spend a certain percentage of spending on education, if you look across the ASEAN region, including in uh, Indonesia, you look at how much uh, spending per capita or per GDP has been over the last decade, it has not increased much. So we've been through a whole decade where there has been improvements in infrastructure, spending, not much in education overall. And that is, a, that is an issue, not just for Indonesia, but for many countries in the region. Middle. 
Hi, my name's Emily Tibbet. I'm with the Nature Conservancy. Um, thank you for everyone's remarks. And this is probably focused mostly to the Indonesians on the panel, maybe John in particular. You know, Indonesia obviously is a vast natural heritage, and um, in terms of its marine um, world, it's probably the epicenter of diversity in the planet. And we know that um, sustainable management of those resources, and let's talk about fisheries, um, is absolutely critical to resilient trade um, and, it's, and a healthy environment. So, you know, the Conservancy is really focused on making those connections. And I just wondered um, to what extent there's a focus on uh, sustainability policies around fisheries trade um, in Indonesia at this point. And thanks. Thank you for, uh, for the question, uh, Emily. There's been a lot of talk about sustainability uh, and moving towards that direction. Uh, the reality is, however, there are many more urgent issues uh, that our government is currently dealing with. Um, so in, you know, really, uh, I doubt, uh, you know, to what extent is there really a strategic, uh, deliberate, uh, comprehensive plan to move in that direction. So that's on the government level. On the level of businesses, um, because businesses, I, I think, up until today are, have not been held uh, as accountable, the awareness is also not quite there yet. But I think that is changing. Uh, businesses, businesses today uh, realize uh, that it is, it is a sustainable, uh, long-term sort of competitive edge to be uh, environmentally sensitive. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, not much yet, but I think the direction is, is positive. Back in the back. Uh, thanks. Mike Billington with Lyndon LaRouche and the ex uh, Executive Intelligence Review. Um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, the, uh, on the negative effect of the economic crisis in the West. Um, you now have Europe generally in free fall, the U.S stagnant at best, but facing a financial bubble that's likely to blow very soon. And John, you just referred to the flood of liquidity. Um, this is largely the result of the fact that the West's approach to their economic crisis has been to print huge quantities of money through QE and bailouts and so on, uh, with very little going into the real economy. So uh, this, the breakdown in the West is, I would assume, having a significant effect on e exports uh, from Indonesia and Asia. But more importantly, I'd like you to expand on what you said about this liquidity. Uh, are you looking at another uh, hot money bubble? Uh, Indonesia was crushed in, in 98 when uh, the last bubble was speculatively broken. And are we looking at that kind of a crisis again? And what do you think has to be done to deal with that, both in Asia and in the West? Maybe Anup can help me out with, uh, with some of the economics here. Uh, with regard to the uh, impact of the slowdown uh, in the West um, on Indonesia, uh, it's limited. Um, five years or six years after uh, the 08 crisis, uh, some parts of the West have recovered better than other parts. The U.S., I think, has uh, recovered much better. But we should remember that the Indonesian economy is about 66 or 70 percent uh, domestic consumption. Um, exports. Uh, only make up about 13% of GDP. Uh, I believe that's uh, correct. If I'm not, please, please correct me. But it's a small percentage uh, compared to markets like Singapore, for example, where exports are 250% of GDP. Um, so the direct impact of a slowdown in the, in the West is limited. There is, however, an indirect impact as a result of uh, lowering prices of commodities, uh, which make up a large chunk of our exports. And we felt that. The prices of coal and all that have, have slumped, and as a result, many of those industries are, are just sort of drifting by. Uh, but even that, uh, we are still maintaining sort of a six plus percent growth, so not so bad. Uh, with regard to your question on liquidity, um, since 2008, I mean, one round after another, there's been you know, quantitative, you know, three rounds of quantitative easings in the US, Europe, uh, a huge amount of stimulus, uh, now we have Japan continuing to uh, pump in money into the system. The U.S. still doing the same thing. Um, so 
uh, you know, there's just, there's just a lot of liquidity go going in. Uh, I'm not so sure there's a bubble yet, though, uh, especially in Indonesia. I think prices are not cheap, uh, even compared to many other ASEAN markets. Uh, but I think it would be also far-fetched to say that there's a bubble. You want to comment? All right, let's add a bit to that. I think uh, John is right in pointing out why Indonesia has been able to avoid some of the effects which we feared uh, last year from the crisis in Europe. And I think he's made all the right points. Uh, you asked about are there, I think you asked, are there financial imbalances now building up? I think uh, the reality is this. There are domestic policies, financial policies, and there's capital coming in. Two factors. Essentially, many countries in Asia, virtually all the countries, including Indonesia, have kept their financial policies to be quite accommodative. Uh, what do I mean by accommodative? A more uh, direct way of saying it is uh, keeping them loose. Uh, keeping monetary policy accommodative or loose keeping fiscal policy accommodative. They've done this uh, because countries have feared the effects from Europe and the United States, and they fear there will be new shocks coming from advanced economies, and therefore, as an insurance against new shocks, financial policies in Asia and other emerging markets have been accommodative or loose. But now we are in a situation where the risks from the rest of the world have gone down, from Europe and the United States. Those risks have gone down. And you have countries now growing close to their potential. Indonesia is growing over 6%. That's clearly, it's growing at a level of its potential. There's probably no what you call output gap left. So we are in a situation where countries like Indonesia are growing at their potential, the output gap has disappeared. There's no slack left. There's capital coming in, and your own policies are accommodative. So judging by what and how central banks operate, policies across Asia in countries where growth is strong need to now tighten their policies in a way and take their financial policies back into a more neutral stance. And the reason why they need to do that is because it is to be expected that if you don't do that and capital keeps coming in, you're going to see financial imbalances build up. Financial imbalances mean you'd find that housing prices, equity prices, asset price bubbles developing. And so across Asia and Indonesia, the credit cycle, the rate of growth of credit is high, and across Asia, this needs to be tightened because countries are growing well and capital is coming in. So yes, there is a risk that there could be, there could be financial imbalances building, there could be risks of housing prices, but at this moment, our assessment is it's not yet at a stage which causes great concerns. You are seeing in sub-segments, cities, and other asset prices of some bubbles. But nationally, in most of Asia, it's a risk, but it's not yet a reality. And that is why policies need to now go back to being more neutral and less accommodative, so we can accommodate capital coming in and not risk asset price bubbles developing. Sir, did you have a question? You had your hand up earlier, no? Please. Uh, Al Jager with the uh, Putra Samporna Foundation. Uh, we focus on the power of education as a social and economic uh, engine and a transformer. And uh, like Pak John, we, uh, we support international education and exchange and increase in the quality of education. Uh, to, to follow up on the previous remarks, uh, today I've heard uh, that from the panelists that we have a great need for modalities for trust. That's international education exchange, uh, human and physical infrastructure development, a need for strategies for growth, a need for depth and capacity of human capital. And we know that education 
It's the engine that provides all of those. We know from recent studies and reports that Indonesia needs thousands or hundreds of thousands of architects, engineers, accountants, technologists, economists, agriculturalists to support the current level of growth and to extend it. Uh, our interpolation of, of the recent McKinsey report shows something that uh, we call, um, that uh, it's called undertoes or riptides where if they're not the, the managers, not the world-class educated uh, technologists to maintain uh, and expand the economic growth so that there's a chance for a retrograde movement. So my question is how can we, how can you support investment in uh, world-class education opportunities for Indonesia? And I uh, would just point out that uh, your ambassador here is one of the great ambassadors for education, having traveled all over the United States, uh, making very motivational speeches, encouraging Americans to come to Indonesia. And I, I would uh, suggest you take a look at his recent commencement address at the University of Florida uh, to share in that kind of inspiration. So my, my question is, how can investments in international class higher education be made. Uh, we know that uh, China is not sending 170,000 students here a year just for the cultural experience. They're, they're building capacity and creativity, which has also been managed here. Thank you. Well, you. Uh, you know, the President's uh, National Export Initiative includes education uh, as an export, and uh, that is when when uh, international students come to the United States, uh, that counts as an export. That's the easy part. The challenge, the challenge is that, um, you know, we, we, we have looked at uh, potential projects on funding education. As, as you know, uh, uh, we are, uh, XM is a uh, three, $35 billion, in, has a $35 billion asset portfolio and we have 400 employees. So we need an intermediary to make it work, and I think that you know we we continue to look at proposals for uh, finance scholarship institutions that are looking at low cost of funding. Uh, we 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 that that's an area of interest to us. How it's structured is critically important. Uh, we can't be processing. We need to be working with someone who who can evaluate scholarship applications and has the knowledge in that area, so we get a bundle in effect. We, don't want, we can't be processing 500 individual scholarship applications. Uh, number two, the terms are different from what we normally finance, which goes up usually, you know, the five, midterm for us is five to seven. Uh, long term is 10, 10 million or more or in 10 years. So given the structure, we, we, we need an institution that's willing to put up a guarantee, a, a local national institution, and better yet, you know, to make it to, to make it mutually beneficial, I think, given the human resource capital need, uh, when in much of ASEAN, including Indonesia, a sovereign guarantee would also facilitate that. So it becomes a partnership uh, to promote education. Um, the last thing I would like to say is that I do think that um, we've encouraged our applicants, particularly when they come from uh, the government area to work side by side with our team and that can provide mid-career professional development training uh, because the way we look at thing, I think the, the economic uh, valuation over the life cycle is something that is not widely accepted um, in Asia yet. People tend to look at price uh, and that's because of the human capital shortness. So actually it will help American exporters if we take a more holistic point of view of evaluating economic value and, and, and we, we welcome proposals in this area. I will, I will take any reasonable proposal to our policy department and our underwriters to try to make it work, but it is challenging. Well, I think we've, uh, unfortunately, I still see tons of hands out there. We've unfortunately run out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists for um, providing a lot of helpful information. Thank you, thanks so much. To have you on our panel. Thank you. Oh, so nice, nice to meet you, John. Hope to see you at Jakarta, yes, yeah? I look forward to talking with you a little uh, you. more. You know, I'd love to. Now that we have more than one customer in. Uh, uh, in